friends, a very warm welcome. Lovely to see you again. Uh, slightly cooler this time this week compared to last week. Um, James, very good to see you. Are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Yes, I'm about um, 14 degrees cooler than I was uh, this time I'm, last week. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Running around Double. 28 at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking very good for your age. No, um, now, friends, before we go any further, don't forget those three wonderful things that will help us to click on like down below, to uh, subscribe so you can pick up things in the future, and also to share. So you can click on the share button and that gives you the link for this video and you can plaster it around your uh, network, your social network, real or online. That would be great, wouldn't it, James? It would be fantastic if people were able to do that, yeah. And uh, I'm sure many people who watch us have all sorts of networks like chapters, deaneries, uh, wider dioceses, Baptist ministers. Follow followings sort of, of millions on Twitter and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, Twitter, <laughs> Twitter millions, yeah. yeah. Now, James, we are really getting well into the Trinity season now because we're coming up to Trinity 7, are we not? Yes, that's right, yeah. Now, James, what is our lectionary gospel reading for this week? Yep, so it's Luke chapter 12 and it's verses 13 to 21. And Luke chapter 12, you say? Yes. My goodness, we skipped a long way. We have skipped. We've skipped over, um, well, most of chapter 11, actually, haven't we? And um, we, we, we've, we've skipped over all the controversy. I don't know why the lectionary writers decided we don't want to do that. But that's that's what we've missed out. A, a long chapter in chapter 11 with some um, significant conflict stories between Jesus uh, and Pharisees and lawyers and, and, and so on. Now, there's two explanations for why we might have skipped those over. Well, there's three possible explanations. Well, two legitimate ones. One is that there are parallel passages yeah. uh, in the other Gospels which are covered in one of the other years, which is yeah. a possibility. But the other possibility, which I think is less likely, is that the lectionary comes back and revisits this at another point because yeah. it doesn't cover Luke always in order. No. I think that's much less likely um the if you want to be scurrilous the other possibility is that the lectionary <laughs> jumps over some of the awkward passages and some of this stuff is pretty awkward isn't it it is yeah i mean it jesus says some really tough stuff i mean if you think of jesus just being nice to everybody and you know gentle jesus meek and mild and um just affirming everybody all the time this is not the chapter you want to read because that is not what he does in chapter 11. um there's there woe to the fact there, aren't there yeah yeah and well, I do. I mean, this is almost comic, isn't it? Um, woe to the Pharisees. Woe you to you Pharisees for you do this. Woe to you Pharisees. You love the best seat in the synagogue. And one of the lawyers answered him saying, teacher, in saying these things about the Pharisees, you insult us too. To which Jesus replies, you, you bet. Woe to you lawyers as well. Yes, is yes. It's just unbelievable. Um, but absolutely extraordinary. But uh, absolutely, of course, consistent with what we've been thinking about in previous weeks where Jesus um, insists essentially that um, he needs to be the center of our attention. Yeah, yeah. And, and that leads to some difficult and uh, yeah. really demanding decisions about what it means to be a disciple. Yeah, and, and including in the passage that we've got in front of us this week, really. Yeah. Now, again, there's an interesting dynamic, there's several interesting dynamics which are really characteristic of uh, this gospel, of Luke's gospel. Um, so once we come into chapter 12, uh, we've got um, people, we've got this dynamic between the crowd on the one hand and the disciples on the other. So beginning of chapter 12, uh, so many thousands of, this is amazing, so many thousands of people yeah. gathered together, they were trampling one another, yeah. but Jesus actually ignores that and starts teaching the disciples. So it's interesting, there's a crowd there and he focuses on the disciples and talks about being beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, and then uh, in the next section, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And then um, in verse 13, which is the beginning of our passage, so he, Jesus, the crowd is there, but Jesus yeah. has been teaching the disciples. Yeah. Yeah. And now, as it were, sort of the crowd intrudes on this. So you've got mm -hmm. this really interesting mm -hmm. dynamic. And then halfway through our passage, he turns to the, he, he tells a parable to the crowd. Yeah. Then at the end of our passage, next section, he then turns to start teaching the disciples. So you do have this interesting dynamic of yeah. the crowd having a role and people from the crowd having a role. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet his teaching is focusing on the disciples and yet the crowd can overhear what that is. So there's kind of like a sort of double dialogue going on there. Yeah, and that seems to be rather characteristic of Luke. I think we've noticed this before, don't we? That, that the crowd are listening in all the time, as it were, mm. to, to the disciples and, and what Jesus is saying to the disciples and their whole dialogue that goes on there. Um, and I, I wonder how much that is true of our church experience today, actually. Um, you know, how much are, are people really listening in 
uh, to what's going on or how how easy do we make it for them to do that that would that would be the real challenge i think jesus is seems very content with this kind of di dynamic um i wonder how content we are with it really well informally speaking that is the position in the church of england because yeah. services of worship are public so anyone All can come public yes and so on the one hand you might have the committed core but you might have people on the fringe as well and yeah. and in one sense that seems to me to be an advantage of of church of england ecclesial polity which is you do have this fringe of course the other challenge is here is the reason why this can happen is that almost all of jesus teaching happens outdoors happens on the, on yeah. the way as luke yeah. Would say yeah. uh in public places so in, in and, and again the evidence is that the early christians also tended to meet in public places they either met at crossroads yeah. or they met in in bathhouses or or they would have met in the atrium of a uh, of a benefactor's house um so there is an argument there for having well in africa very often churches start they start meeting under a tree yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, the trees. Are Again, you can you can actually physically have a core gathered yeah. close, but yeah. the crowd will be listening in. Yeah, so. and I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I was in well, as you were. I was in York the other day and um, walked walk down one of the streets, and there was a a chap. I think he was doing a conjuring act, but he was speaking very, you know, clearly. He was really working the crowd, and the crowd was just building up. You're just attracted to somebody who's saying something interesting yeah. about yeah. what they're doing. I mean, it's just a natural, very natural thing to do, and that seems to be the dynamic that Jesus has. Mm. Mm. So, should we begin to look at the passage itself? Yeah. Um, and what's again the shape of the passage is quite interesting because you have the interruption from the crowd and then you have that as a scene setter for jesus teaching a parable now i know in an earlier sort of generation commentator said oh well, this is a kind of a lucan artifice he's creating a situation but i'm I, i'm not persuaded by that really i mean it's not it's not an unnatural thing to happen and one of the dynamics of jesus teaching is he often responds to questions and to challenges yeah yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And and why not? And it's very interesting. The question itself is is really telling Jesus, we, I want you to act as my lawyer. I mean, it's uh, you know, tell, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me is asking Jesus to act as a lawyer. And it's it's fascinating, isn't it? In the previous chapter, Jesus has just been having giving the lawyers a hard time. So maybe the crowd think, well, uh, Jesus would be much better at this than than the lawyers that he's just condemned. So let's ask him. But yeah. the really fascinating thing is because he absolutely refuses to act in that way. So um we ought to make one qualification on the word lawyer because lawyer, yeah, we should, not really in a technical sense that we would think yeah. of a lawyer no. um but it is about someone who is a, an expert in the meaning of torah yes yes and and of course the reason why jesus who if he, jesus is judged as an expert in torah yeah. then by the way it just points out that jesus was as far as we can see all the evidence of the gospels jesus was a torah observant jew yeah he disagrees with the Pharisees about their interpretation of the law, but he never is, is depicted as breaking the law or, or disregarding the law of the no, Torah. No, no. And of course, Torah is concerned with all sorts of aspects of life. So there are a couple of passages in Deuteronomy yeah. 21 and Numbers 27, which specifically deal with that, that, that question of inheritance. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, interesting that the fact that even Jesus' opponents or critics or the general crowd re re seem to regard him with respect and again, also interesting that he is addressed as teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which again so, is characteristic of Luke and is a term, a term of respect. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, I think this, this, the, the question itself is is really interesting because, you know, it, apparently the rabbis taught that if, if you know, you were uh, due to inherit and you were, you were both heirs, um, then, and one of you said, you wanted the inheritance to be divided because of course normally in families you didn't divide the inheritance because you you, you held property and stuff in common um but if you the rabbi said that if you wanted that then then that should be granted mm. so um the, you know they're drawing on a, a tradition in um ancient judaism that mm. in a sense the the man thinks he's got a right and jesus needs to uphold his right so he's crying out i want my share i want my justice um, but Jesus says, mm, I'm not going to play ball with that, actually. Uh, no, it is interesting that on the one hand, um, he, his address to the man, man, he says, yes. man, which yeah, is actually man, yeah. a rebuke, yeah. Uh, yeah. actually it reminds me of in John chapter two, the wedding at Cana in Galilee, where Mary makes a request to his mother and she said he addresses her as woman, which seems to be a similarly sort of formal put down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Who made me judge or arbiter over you? Um, and then that leads into both his saying, take care and be on your guard against covetousness, and then his parable about the, the rich man. So it, yeah. 
Well, how, how do we make sense of this change? Now, I know you've been reading Kenneth Bailey on this particular yeah. passage. He's been very good in this in this section of Luke. Yeah, well, it, 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 yeah, and and he has a a, a really interesting quotation actually. I mean, I, I, I could quote from him. He hmm. says that it takes a special brand of courage to tell antagonists that their naked cry for justice is not enough, that they must begin with a new understanding of themselves. So he's pointing out that yes, there's a cry for justice, and in a sense, it is a legitimate cry for justice, but it's peculiarly a cry for my justice. This is about this is what I want. And it, Jesus will not not play ball with that. And I think all through the encounter with the man, but also in the parable, Jesus is coming against this idea that we are isolated individuals who can just basically ask Jesus to, to let us do what we mm. want. We are people in community and, and particularly, of course, we're called into the community of the body of Christ where um, the, it's actually the way of Jesus that matters, not the way of anybody else. Uh, certainly not the way of any individual. And that also, there's also, if I can put it this way, there's also something to do with theological anthropology, which is a fancy yeah. way of saying how we see ourselves before God, because, of course, this isn't just a rebuke to individualism on the one hand, it's also a rebuke to desire. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jesus characterises this as, a, as covetousness, a desire for wealth, a desire for things. Mm. And although on the surface the man's claim looks like one which is a simple call for justice, actually Jesus sees through that and says, well, hang on a second, actually, there's something much more fundamental about how do we how do we make sense of the desires that we feel found inside of us? Uh, and, and what does Jesus want to do in relation to those? And actually, rather than say, well, I have this desire and I think it's just that it should be satisfied, Jesus says, hang on a minute, I want to actually start all over again by rethinking who you are in the sight of God. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think what Jesus puts his finger on here, particularly helpfully, is the, the toxic nature of a cry for individual justice mm. and covetousness or greed or whatever. And mm. when those two things combine, that there is a, a very serious problem if you give into them. And actually, personally, I know this because um, I, I, I was due to inherit some, some money and, uh, uh, and I, I needed it. Um, and there was a kind of covetousness of it and I wasn't granted it. So that the person who was the executor of the estate didn't, didn't give it to me. And it was a very difficult thing to deal with that internal injustice, yeah. Yeah. but also think actually I really, I really want that money. Yeah. That's pretty toxic, actually. You had to work through that quite carefully. It is, and we've been challenged as well. I mean, I think one of the one of the things which is fascinating about this passage in our contemporary context is that, I mean, I comment on the blog that when you're in an agrarian uh, culture, yes. like as they yes. were, yes, actually, the only way to accumulate any capital, any wealth at all, wasn't through your earnings because you simply. No. Uh, uh, your, your farming would just give you a subsistence level right. if you actually wanted any wealth at all for, for surplus security beyond you know what you're earning now you could only do that by inheriting yeah now lo and behold look what's happened to our culture in the last five years mm. 10 years five years with house prices yeah. escalating i mean yeah. it, it began with the privatization of um or the selling off of um property in uh, from councils under thatcher and it gradually has accelerated and it means that, it, that i think a lot of commentators are noticing that our culture now is basically a, a kind of two-class culture of, of those with those who own property yeah. and those who don't yeah and for the next generation the children of those who own property can can own property because their parents do but actually those who don't they're they cut out yeah 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 um, so this so, idea that people can we're in, we're in a we're in an economy where people can you know, by by stint of their own, you know, cleverness. Pull up by the bootstraps. Yeah, they can't do it actually. No, well, no. So, so the whole question of inheritance is is very, very pertinent. It's very pertinent. Yeah, yeah. Now we get into the parable itself, and again, yeah. it's very characteristic of Jesus in Luke. Um, actually, I'm looking at the ESV, and it slightly disguises the introduction. I wonder if the oh no, the TNIV is actually slightly better, um, because Jesus talks about. Uh, Anthropo, anthrop, anthropos tenos, yes, anthropotenos, the, 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 a rich man, a yeah. certain man who was rich. And yeah. he says this quite often, a certain person who's doing this. It's a yeah. way of introducing his, the, the teaching. Yes. Uh, and the other thing which is quite characteristic in, of Jesus in, in Luke's gospel is this soliloquy. 
Yeah. Rather than talking about yeah. different people engaging, the man engaged in soliloquy. And there's a lovely par parallel with that um, a few chapters on in chapter 18, where Jesus talks about the, the Pharisee and the tax collector praying at the temple. And a beautiful phrase, little detail, where he says the Pharisee stands and prays to himself. Yes, it's so, 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 so telling, telling, isn't it? Praise to God. It is. And we have this saying in English, don't we? You know, um, talking to yourself is the first sign of madness. <laughs> and actually what Jesus is saying here is talking to yourself is the first sign that you've, you've lost it with God. You're not, you're not mm. on the right track yeah. because this is just extraordinary um, conversation that he has with himself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, Kenneth Bailey, who does these um, uh, poetic analyses of parables. So mm. recognizes they're in poetic in form and, and what he calls chiastic structures. Um, points out that the centre of, of such a parable is always the really important bit. And the centre of this one is verse 18, where he actually has this, um, where, he, where he basically he plans what he's going to do. I will, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And the problem, of course, of this is that it's his plan. It's, not, it's got, not, got nothing to do with God. It's got nothing to do with the yeah. one who has given him um, all, these, all, all this uh, plenty and and so that's a that's a it's a massive problem and and that's the thing that's really at the heart of the parable that he's thinking i'm just living in isolation from everybody else yeah and, and i'm okay and i will be now, right I, does 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 um bailey talk much about the actual social context there because one of the things that strikes me is that if you live in first century israel and village life Mm. it's very communal and it's very striking if somebody is doing this and they are building these barns for themselves and storing stuff for themselves and they've got this big store and mm. actually around them are all these people on the bread line yeah yeah and it's yeah. A, it's an, it is an extraordinary striking i think again it would have been very very striking, very striking yeah to anybody listening they say you can't live like that they would have thought you can't no. possibly live like that I mean, and i think uh, our our context deadens it to us because of course we're used to yes. food being stored in barns because we you know we know like in ukraine at the moment that, that all yes. the grain is in barns yeah. and it isn't being yeah. shipped out so they can't yeah. put the next thing in so yeah and we're, and we're used to people putting stuff down and building bigger stuff which, you know big, bigger yeah. storehouses bigger warehouses i mean yeah. you, you drive up and down the country on a motorway that's that's what you see people just building bigger and bigger and yeah particularly the amazon warehouses <laughs> yeah exactly yeah amazon um, particularly. Uh, and i think this being cut off from the, the others others around and being cut yes. off from god i mean there's a couple of things that come out of that one is that i found it the last the last uh, uh particularly the last sort of eight or nine years and i've been doing a lot more gardening and building raised beds and i'll tell you what there's nothing like growing your own food yeah. as an antidote to thinking that food just comes from tesco's yeah yeah it, yeah. it really doesn't it really does come from the ground and it needs the soil and the yeah. sun and the water and you know and yes. I, I if you don't grow your own food and you do think that tomatoes come from tesco's it is um uh, it does yeah. put you in a, in a very different position i think yes and you realize how hard it you know how how vulnerable growing is you've got to do it right i mean last year i had tomato blight so right. i lost the end yeah. of my tomato harvest yeah and yeah. it's yeah. devastating isn't it personally yeah. you're, you're so uh, it's just awful when that happens you know, yeah. you've, ten yeah. you've tended it you've done all that work on it and suddenly something something unexpected which you are not in control of this is the key thing isn't it um, this man cannot possibly be in control because as god says to him you fool this very night your life is is required of you is demanded yeah. of you and and what are you going to do with all this stuff you know you're not, you don't take it with you and I think the other second thing I can observe on this is that this lack of concern for God and lack of concern for others, what, what is I find really fascinating in the sort of Luke Acts is the way that, you know, we know that Luke is always concerned with the economic implications. Yes, so we've got a lot of Jesus' economic yes. parables. And then we find in Acts chapter two, the, the exact opposite of, the, of, of this guy, this rich man, mm. this rich mm. fool. Mm. Uh, so you get in Acts 2 that the, 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 apostles, the, the, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking bread and to prayer. Right. Everyone was filled with all the signs and wonders. And all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, not just actually within the community, but, but yeah. anyone. Yeah. And they kept, so they have this up dimension of yeah. daily praying and celebrating and praising God on the one hand. And that led to the out dimension to be caring yeah. for others as well. Yeah. Now this this puts me in a bit of a difficult position politically, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm very conscious that many people criticise the bishops of the Church of England or other Christian leaders mm. for always having a left of centre 
kind of, you know, whether it's, whereas the Church of England used to be the Conservative Party at prayer, it's now either the Labour Party or the, the Green Party. Mm. Um, and in one sense, I can see why that is, because you've got a very communitarian ethic here. Mm. But I'd actually go further than that and say, the kind of, well, it's not really even, if not even an ethic, I mean, Jesus's teaching here isn't sort of focused on ethics. It's really focused on whether we live our lives turned into ourselves yes or, or whether we live our lives turned out to god and to other people yes yeah. so it's a, it's a theocentric view rather yeah. than an ethical yeah. view yeah but the whole register of western society which is measured by accumulation by consumerism yeah I, i've been very struck by the debate about the um so for anyone who watches this later this states it very very clearly yeah, yeah, yeah. the debate about the next conservative leader i mean the competence seems to be which one's going to make us richer yeah and that seems to which be one is going to which one is going to build bigger plans for us? Yeah, and there's just a sort of there's a kind of um, well, I, I find it an insulting assumption, frankly, that that's the only thing that anybody should be bothered about, or uh, particularly those who are voting for that leader should be bothered about. Yeah. Um, that, what does that say about the bankrupt nature of our political discourse? Uh, and I think but it isn't think, just a, it isn't just a left right thing as well because I mean you no, could say you could say that you know that the agenda of the left is to say well we'll all be wealthier by having a higher level of tax and and the people on the right will say we'll all be wealthier by having a, a lower level of tax and I kind of want to say but but that isn't even the right question to be starting with no, I mean, there are much no. more much more basic questions we ought yeah. to be asking about our, our lives yes and even if even if you don't even in political debate even if you don't want to talk about God at the very least follow the way, way of Jesus and, and talk about how we how we want to be living with one another as it were yeah. how we want to be with one another in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in society that mm. that's not that doesn't seem to be tackled either and it is amazing how much the landscape has changed in well in our in, in our lifetime james because mm. um mm. you know I, I expect we can remember we can we're old enough to remember back <laughs> before yeah. uh free market economics dominated the West yeah, and yeah. where where life in the UK was a lot more communitarian. Now let me just mention one example on the on the yeah, blog. You mentioned um, one on the blog, I think. Yeah, yeah. the virologist uh, virologist Jonathan Ball. Yeah. Who, who lived? Who's an, he actually? I think he's here in Nottingham, where I am. Right. He recalls his childhood in the mining villages of Nottinghamshire in the nineteen seventies, where each village was a community and everyone looked out looked after one another. And yeah. all that was just destroyed when the the mining industry was was uprooted. Yeah. Yeah. But I also remember. When I first came to faith in the 70s and 80s, there was a very strong strand in of, of what I might call Christian radical thinking. So I'm yeah. thinking about um, people like Ronald Sider, who's yeah. still on. Yeah, rich Christians and, in an age of hunger and all that. Yeah, yeah. and Richard Foster, yeah. who's talking about, well, he, he wrote The Celebration of Discipline. He wrote another book, which actually I thought was even better, which yeah. people knew about, called The Freedom of Simplicity. Yeah, that, I think that's an excellent book, yeah. And and one of the things he says is that, you know, things possessions are called possessions because they possess you. And you've got to, you know, Jesus wants to break the power of possessions. And one of the yeah. ways you do that, his di spiritual discipline is giving things away. But that, that's something I know that you've, you've practiced, isn't it? Yeah, we, 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 we um, had Lent this year and we decided we, we would, Get, give away something every single day during Lent not not as a I mean not not because you know we're kind of trying to show off but I mean it's, it was really trying to practice get into I think part of this is about the, the formation of habits actually we, we if, if you don't have the habit of getting rid of stuff or giving it away or whatever mm -hmm. then it's very very difficult to do it when you need to do it so you, you need to ex flex the muscle exercise the muscle so that so that when something really important and a need comes that somebody needs some of your stuff you're actually already semi-detached from it. Yeah. Um, did you find it that a difficult discipline? Um, it was quite difficult sometimes. Um, it, and, and it led to some discussion between my wife and I about <laughs> what was going to be given away. <laughs> um, you know, let's, let's put it that. you like, dear. I think we should give that away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it does make you think. It does definitely make you think. Um, uh, and I suppose the the thing is, you you need to keep ramping it up really to start giving away the things that you really like or you want to hold on to. You know, you can start at the sort of low level where things that you don't really bother too much about, but mm -hmm. you need to keep ramping it up because, uh, as I say, it it is it's just like an athlete. You you need to train in order to be able to win the race, and I think that's it, it's that's what we need to be doing. Another confession, I, I must I observe it myself. It's harder as you get older. I don't know if you yeah. find the same. Yeah, I, yeah. I actually managed to be quite radical. When I worked in business and I was single and I didn't have any worries about kids or aged parents or 
whatever mortgage payments i did well i did have a mortgage actually but that was when houses are affordable uh, but I, I actually did aim to give away 40 percent of my income yeah that's that, well that's really impressive yeah yeah and the challenge was i knew i was then quite uh, halfway through i knew i was going to start ordination training the temptation was to keep money back yeah yeah but, but the, but the yeah. challenge was to, to still be generous and to yeah. trust god for his provision and, and I'm I'm absolutely sure that any Christian who gi who gives away you know uh, gives proportionally of their their income I think we give away about twelve percent now um, the that actually God uh, my experience is that God relentlessly honours that mm. so that when you do have a need he's he's there and we've had some extraordinary mm. stories of God providing for us you know mm. checks through the letterbox um, you know cash in a brown envelope through the vicarage letter, letterbox mm. those sorts of things have happened when we've needed it. Yeah. Um, and that, that lesson, we, we need to learn, keep learning that lesson over and over again. But um, yeah, it is harder as you get older. To keep... I mean, and I should say we were once actually investigated by by HMRC um, and they sent two people around to our house. And the reason it turned out was they simply didn't believe that people gave away 12 percent of their income. So, yeah. And of course, at the time, um, I think it, you, 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 you took that off the child tax credit, what you gave away didn't count under what you qualified for the child tax credit. So they simply didn't believe my income was as low as it actually was. <laughs> but of course they had to back off. Because <laughs> I had the evidence. You know. Well, this passage is just so relevant to contemporary culture in so many different ways, isn't it? So yeah, James, it's been fact we could we could talk for another half hour, I'm sure. I'm sure we but thank you very much. Friends, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that we 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 really hope that you find this helpful as we try and bring the word to life that it opens up so that your preaching on this can be challenging but life-giving as well uh, uh, as you engage with these questions of wealth and possessions thank you for joining us don't forget uh like uh subscribe share, subscribe, subscribe. A little button share. comes over here i think i, I don't i want to put it in front of your face again james as it comes up yeah anyway. you always do don't you <laughs> <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you next time yeah bye-bye